Hi everybody, it's great to be back here again tomorrow. It's Friday and we're getting ready for the the height of the year, Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonement, and of course it's Shabbat, which is the holiest time of any time. And a combination of the two in one in one um, day is amazing. And um, it's an opportunity for us to really feel that holiness. And it's a day that we should be happy. A lot of people, oh, oh fast is coming, we can't eat, we can't drink, etc. It's, it's completely going to knock them off their feet. You know? But in reality, it's a happy time, and we should try to realize that if we tap into the spiritual and we, we try to connect to the words of the prayer, Hashem just brings us through that beautiful day. It's a day of 24 hours of, of just separating ourselves from the physical realm, the physical world, and connecting to the spiritual side of things, and it's a, such a powerful day. Well, right now we are in Erev Yom Kippurim, and today is a very important day that we should be involved in eating. It's a very big mitzvah, according to the Magen Avraham and according to um, our commentaries. They say that eating on the eve, the Erev, today, before the, the um, fast sets in, is a great, great mitzvah. It's a great commandment. In other words, um, number one, we are preparing ourselves by eating today. We're preparing ourselves for um, to be ready for the fast, to pray stronger, to be more... Um, awake, awake when during our um, um, prayers tomorrow as well. So besides that, it's a great happy day. It's today is, God says anyone who eats today is going to be like you fast two days. So it's a very special thing and you shouldn't skip over that. Most people some um, have a couple of meals today and they should try to you know walk around with something to a little nash on. It's a very important thing and um, let's not take it lightly. Some other customs we have for Erev Yom Kippurim um, our number one a ritual bath. It's very important to enter the holiday cleanse and pure, and, and those who have an, op- an option of going into a mikvah or finding some kind of lake or something to go into um, or a spring before the holiday, it's a very, very special thing. And if those who can't for some reason do that, if a shower, let them open a shower up and make sure the water is pouring on you at least en- enough to allow about 11 liters of water to come on your entire body, and that would be a second best kind of situation, but at least do that if you can't go to a ritual bath. Very important to come into the holiday feeling cleansed and ready to enter such a special special um, dimension of, of prayer and spirituality. Um, we have a custom, of course, of giving charity. Uh, it's charity is atonement, a very important thing today to do that. In the Minhag of Kaparot, you know, as we, um, again, wrap up our 10 days of repentance as we find, of course, we're going to finish everything up. The finale is going to be, of course, Yom Kippurim. But today it's very important. These, these things we do, of course, to bless the children, bless the family, all these things. You want to be ready and make a beautiful suda, a beautiful meal. Again, today is like we're going to be eating for Shabbat tomorrow, Yom Kippur tomorrow. So today it's very important to do all that. Um, I'd like to focus on today, our message for Yom Kippurim this year, the new year, is going to be on the a little bit about the message of the book of Yonah, the prophet Jonah. And we know that it is a Jewish custom for to read something called the Haftarah. In other words, after we read the, the um, Torah portions, we add an additional reading from the prophets. And this is a custom that our um, um, rabbis or our forefathers um, enacted long ago. There are different, again, opinions exactly when did it begin and why did it begin. But we find it in the Geonim. They talk about, and Rav Hai Gaon talks about it being way back to the times of Ezra Sofer, right? Ezra Sofer. Um, which brings it back into the beginning, right? You know, again, we're talking about the beginning of the Second Temple period. And there are other opinions talking about happening in the, in the, the middle of the Second Temple period. Whatever it is, it's an ancient custom of reading the um, prophets that are connected somehow to the day, to the reading of the Torah. And on Yom Kippur, we have a very special custom. We, on the Mincha, towards we, we read, it's only time a year we have a custom today to read an Aftarah, an additional reading from the prophets in the Mincha service time, which is in the afternoon. We usually read it in the morning hours. And so here we're going to do both. We're going to read in the morning an Aftarah, and in the afternoon we're going to read, it, we're going to read an Aftarah, which is going to be talking about the, the prophet Jonah in the afternoon. And the question is, why are we accustomed to read the prophet Jonah for? And that's, um, 
to be our lesson today, a little bit to try to understand why do we have this custom and what is it about the prophet Yonah? A little bit, whatever we can discuss. And I'd like to get right into it. Who is Yonah? Who is the prophet Jonah in the Bible? So if we look in our sources, um, we see, if you're familiar with um, the story of Elijah, the prophet, um, Elijah is told in the, in the um, book of Kings, chapter 1, um, I'm sorry, Kings 1, chapter 17, and God tells him to go to um, a place called Tzalfata. Tzalfata. Tzalfata is a place in Sidon. Sidon is in the, today in Lebanon, right? And he tells Elijah the prophet to, when he goes to Sidon, he says he should be staying over there um, with a woman who is a widow, and she is going to support you. And this is what Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet is told. And he goes, as God commands him, and he gets there, and the woman is a very poor, she barely has enough food for herself, she, she explains, and her son, she has just a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, and Elijah blesses her, etc., and, and of course takes care of that issue. And her son, unfortunately, has some kind of, um, he's not feeling well, and he, Eliyahu, and he dies, literally, but Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, we all know, familiar with that, he brings him back to life. And that's, that's the famous, one of the famous stories. Uh, so it reminds us, of course, of Eliyahu's student, Eli, um, Elisha. Why well, didn't I say that in English? Elisa, whatever, Elisha, we say in Hebrew. So the, we see something very interesting, and it was the merit of Elijah the prophet that this young man, this her child of this woman, that he was commanded to go there and she and allow her to support him. Um, this the, her son was um, was blessed to be alive in the merit of Elijah the prophet. Who is the son that he goes to? And the answer is our rabbis teach us this son was Jonah the prophet. In other words, Elijah revived Jonah the prophet Jonah. Now if we look at the Torah and we ask ourselves. What other places in the Bible um, is the prophet Yoda mentioned? And if we look, there's only one of the places mentioned in the book of Kings. It says in Kings 2, verse 14, it says, Who is Shivet Gvul Yisrael Melavo Hamat Ad Yamarava? Talks about Yoravam the king, um, Yoravam ben, ben um, Yoash. This was the second Yoravam, there were two Yoravams. Or Jeroboam, you say it in English, but it's the second, it's the second Yoravam. And it says, Kidvar Hashem Elohim Yisrael Asher Diber Biyad Avdo. And here are the words, as God spoke to his servant, Yonah ben Amitai, Jonah, the son of Amitai, Asher mi Gata Chefe, who was from a place called Gata Chefe. In other words, Jonah, or Yonah, let's, I like to use the Hebrew names, let's get used to them. Yonah was from Gat a place called Gat Hefer. And he is mentioned here in the Book of Kings as he as prophesied. It doesn't say what he prophesied, but it says as God spoke to him, what, what happened, you know, he, he calls him a servant of God. Whatever it is, if we look in the beginning of the book, well, first of all, where is Gat a If we look in the Book of Joshua, we see in Joshua chapter 19, if you look in, um, in verse number, well, you can look in verse number 10 to 13, because it talks all about the borders of Zebulun, Zvulun. And it says in verse 13, Mizracha, from there it went um, eastward uh, to a place called Gat Hefer, or Gita Hefer. In other words, which is. Again, it continues to say, though it goes, I'm not going to go into all the, all the border details, but whatever it is, Gata Hefer is a place in Zebulun's territory, in Zvulun. So, according to this, it seems very, very, very um, simple. If you want to try to find out what tribe was, the, was Jonah from, we could say from, this, from these verses here, it seems that Jonah was in the tribe of Zebulun. And, and as a matter of fact, the Talmud in, in the Jerusalem Talmud, brings down two opinions. One opinion is saying that he's in the tribe of Zebulun. Another, another opinion is in the tribe of Asher. Because um, Sidon, 
is in the, was in the tribe of Asher. Sidon again, um, Sidon, which is in Lebanon, that was in the area of Asher. So and that's we we spoke about a minute ago. We were talking about that Elijah revived um, Jonah. So the question is again, you know, he was either for sure from the north, and either the tribe of Zebulun or the tribe of Asher. Which we'll get as a matter of fact, I'm going to read about it on course Sukkot, the Shemini Yatzeret. We finally complete the Torah, which uh, we'll talk about hopefully that portion. We'll find the time in between the holidays to get to the last book of the Torah that we haven't done yet. Zot Bracha. But anyway, summarizing things now, we see Jonah is again somehow connected to Elijah the prophet. Number two, we see that there's two possibilities of which tribe he was from, but he was from the north. And we see that he's called in the book of Kings the Evid, a servant of God. But if we look in the book of, jo- of Jonah, right, what does it say? If we read the first opening verse, it says like this. I think my glass of small print here. It says the, the word of God said to the, um, the word of God was upon the prophet Yona ben Amitai, saying, here for some reason it doesn't call him the servant of God. There's something missing over here. And in why in the book of Kings he's called the servant of God, and here he's not called the servant of God. Well, it's interesting that to think about that. But let's read the first few verses together and try to get to the big, the major question that I'd like to focus on, and then try to explain the connection, of course, to Yom Kippurim, to the Day of Atonement. Why we? Why do we read this for? And it says right away in the second verse, God says, "Kum lechel Ninveh." God says, "Go to the city of Ninveh." Ninveh was again in present-day Iraq. It was the king of Ass- that was the Assyrian kingdom. Ha'ira Gedola, the big city, the capital, ukra aleha ki alta ratam lefanai. In other words, God is sending the prophet to this city of idol worshippers, Ninveh, and he wants them. He wants God. He wants Yonah to go there and to reach out to them, because their evils come upon me. In other words, God. He's looking at the city, and it's a city that's doing evil, and God wants to, he's sending one of his Jewish prophets to go out there to try to rectify them. Vayakom Yona Livroach Tarshisha. But what does Yona do? He runs away. He comes, in, he doesn't want to fulfill the words of God. So the question, of course, we must ask ourselves, this is very strange. If God tells you to do something, we should do it, of course. For surely his servants, his prophets, we, we just read a minute ago in the book of Kings, he's called God's servant. So why isn't God's servant being a servant and doing the word of God? Why is he running away for? It doesn't make sense. But in reality, we see it's not the first time in Jewish history where we see our leaders, our prophets, have tried to get out of things. You know, if you think about that, what would be a good example would be Moses himself, Moshe Rabbeinu, we know when God was trying to get him to go to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh, or Pharaoh, whatever the word in English, I don't know, I try to say it. Pharaoh, I don't know. <laughs> Palo. <laughs> he tried to go to Pharaoh, and what did Hashem say? Um, um, what did Moshe Rabbeinu say? You know, they're not going to listen. Whatever he said, who am I? Moshe was trying to get out of all this thing. And eventually God gets angry, and then he says, okay, your, your brother Aaron is going gonna, is gonna to be a speech to you, and it can be a war help you with you know, this whole process of getting them out of Egypt. In other words, we see Moshe Rabbeinu also not, not being, in other words, not giving in right away and saying, here I am, I'm doing it. We see, of course, later on, we see later on um, the prophet Jeremiah as well is asked, you know, and God says, to, he, God, you know, he says to God, I'm just a now, I'm just a child. So he's also trying to get out of, of, of his prophecy. In other words, it's not the first time we've seen something like this take place. Of course, whatever the reason may be, um, we have to understand that each instance, what, what, what are those reasons behind the salvanut, you know, the refusal of doing the word of Hashem? In each case, there's a different reason behind it. And the Talmud teaches us in the Tractate of Sanhedrin, it's a very, very serious offense when a prophet does not, holds back his prophecy. In other words, if God has given you a prophecy, you must fulfill it. You must fulfill it. You must do what you're told in that prophecy. So it's all the more so, it's something that's dangerous for, for a prophet not to do what he's told. And because it says he's obligated with his life. 
he doesn't do it. So what made it so difficult for the prophet Jonah to run away? What could be a possible reason behind that? And I'd like to bring a couple of um, quick explanations which are brought down. There are different explanations. And I'd like to first read the famous commentary, Rashi, which um, explains in, in explains to us one of the reasons why he did not um, why he did not want to fulfill his prophecy. And Rashi says he ran away to Telshish. Now Telshish is a city, you know, if you're looking, if you understand the map of Israel. So he he went to Yafo, which was the port, and he got on a boat. It's, it sort of connects to the fact that he's probably from the tribe of Zebulun, Zulun, who we know that they were into boats. <laughs> Because they would go out and they would do um, training on the boats. And anyway, Talshish was an ancient city that they would, um, you know, people would, would go and rent boats to go out there to do, to do business and trading. And there are two different opinions which cities. Some people say it was the, um, the southern part of Turkey um, in that area. And others bring it to um, Tunisia, which um, is another, which is the ancient city of Cargo these two options, but whatever it is, it's far away from Ninveh, which is the other side completely. You haven't gotten a boat and went out to the sea, you know, and Ninveh is all across the Jordan River on the other side, on the eastern side. This is the west. He's going the opposite direction completely to get away from this mission of God. And right away, Rashi says to us, why do you go, why do you go to the sea for? You know, why do you run into a boat and get it to go to Talshish? And Rashi says, he says like this, he says, um, he says, I'm going to run away to the sea. Because we know that divine presence does not rest outside of Israel. In other words, what was the, what was the, the, you know, the, the mindset of the prophet Jonah running away? He says, you know, outside of the land of Israel, there is no divine presence. In other words, prophecy needs to have that special level of spirituality. And we know you can really only prophesy in the land of Israel for, for the sake of the land of Israel. So you can't really reach a high spiritual level of prophecy outside the land. So that's what Yoda wanted to do. If I run, if I go in a boat and I can't hear the word of God anymore, I'm just going to just, just somehow get away from this whole thing. I don't want to do this. And God, and Rashi goes on to say, but God has ways of bringing them back. And he brings an example, he said, Rashi says, like a servant of a, of a priest whose um, servant ran away inside a um, graveyard. And we know a priest can't enter a graveyard, so how does he get him out of there? He says, don't worry, he has servants, other servants to bring him out of there. <laughs> and, um, and therefore, Rashi goes on to say that Yonah says, why did he want to go to the city of Ninveh? Amar Akum Kovei goes, the nations of the world in this area, he goes, they were close to repenting. Im Omar Lehem if I say to them, they're definitely going to repent. And therefore, what's going to happen is, it's going to look very, very bad. I'm going to end up causing damage to the people of Israel. Why? When did this take place? We know that the, from Ninveh is, is the Assyrian kingdom, which is going to be coming about years afterwards, is going to rise up and expel the ten tribes of Israel. So Jonah, again, Jonah was one of these, again, he was a member of the ten tribes. He knew, he, he knew that, they, he so had felt that this would be a very bad thing, a very bad thing for Israel, because God is trying to get Israel to repent, and he's sending prophets throughout those ages before, up until the point of the expulsion of the ten tribes. God is trying to get them to repent, sending them prophets. But they're not listening to them. So how is it going to look in the eyes of the world? And of course, how is Hashem going to relate to it? If he sees that his people are not listening to his word, and these idol worshippers are listening to the word of the prophet, it's going to look very bad for Israel. So this was really what inspired the prophet Jonah to refuse his important mission of trying to bring back Ninveh to repentance. And this is what Rashi explains. And to actually strengthen even more, I'd like to read to you another source, a source 
brought by, written by Rav Menachem Mendel Merimanov, one of the um, a Hasidic master, a student of Rabbi Elimelech Melizonsk, one of the Hasidic masters, and he wrote this in the 1700s. And a very profound explanation of why, what caused Yonah to run away. And he says like this, he says, um, he goes, we have to really try to understand what do we need to read on this whole story of the book of Jonah, Yonah? What does it teach us? And if it's going to teach us about prophecy, he says, I mean, the I'm sorry, prophecy of, of repentance to teach us what it is to repent. He goes, well, the book of Hosea, Hosea, like the prophet Hosea, Hosea, it's all about repentance already and explained there very, very well. And in the five books we talk about repenting. So the question is, what do we need another prophet to talk about repentance for? That is what um, Rabbi Nachman Mendel here is asking. And he goes on to say, He said, therefore, it seems that one of the teachers teach us how can we connect ourselves with the love of the nation of Israel? With all our heart and soul. In other words, he's saying the prophet of Jonah apparently is coming to something else to teach us a love for, for our people. And he's saying like this, He's saying, if, if the people of Israel do not love one another, and not united with that love, they can't really love Hashem, God. Therefore, the story is all about how this prophet wanted to give his life for Israel. And which was so much ingrained in his heart. And therefore, he was willing to give up two, lo- two worlds. In other words, Jonah the Prophet was willing to give up this world and the world to come. That's what he means by two worlds. And we'll see what we mean. What he, how do we see that in the book itself? And he's saying, because in the beginning when he runs away from God, literally, he was rebelling against God. In other words, he's willing to give up his, his world to come, you know, rebelling against God. And which is a terrible sin, as we mentioned before, when, you, when a prophet doesn't do the word of Hashem and, 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 and do his mission. And when he gets to the boat, and he rents this boat, don't, it says that he's the one who rented the boat. In other words, he paid for the entire boat. And he gave up all his wor- worldly possessions on the boat in order to run away from the mission. So we see that he's willing to, on one hand, give up his world, this future world, and this world, everything he had. He was willing to put everything on line, for one thing, to show his love for Israel, that if I run away, I'm not going to have to go and, and make these people repent. And if they repent, they're going to bring a bad name for the people of Israel. Look at that. And um, he goes on to say, he took upon himself all this for his love for Israel. So God forbid it wouldn't bring a kitrug, a kitrug is it wouldn't bring a, um, a uh, when you come, someone, a, what's the word I'm looking for, kitrug, when someone tries to, come and speak evil against, you know, that's a kitrug. I'm trying to explain in a good word, the word kitrug is, um, well, you can look like this, when you have a court case, right? You have someone, the defense, who's coming over to defend, you know, a, um, a person, and then you have those who want to put him away. <laughs> so basically, a kitrug is giving the reasons why to put him away, put him in prison. That's what a kitrug is all about. And he goes on to say, um, Jonah says that these nations of the world, are, as I mentioned before, are close to repenting, and therefore I have to get out of it. So now he asks the question, why were these idol worshippers close to repenting? And he says, in reality, it is easier for them because they have the seven laws. That's the basic, the minimum requirement. So all they have to do is give up their idol worship, give up their other sins, the seven basic things, and then they're there already. But he's saying, on the other hand, Israel has 613 commandments to do. It is a harder kind of thing. And whatever it is, um, okay, I think we can stop here. It's enough to understand. So whatever it is, we, we summarize the words of Menachem Mendel Meriminov. We see that um, Jonah ran away for his love for his people. He was afraid. He was afraid that, God forbid, this would bring a bad, bad um, kitru. When the, when the accuser comes along, they're going to accuse Israel. Like I said, the Kitrug is going to bring a very, very bad name for Israel, and it's going to cause Israel to be suffer and be punished. He wanted to prevent that. And that's this explanation here of, of Menachem Mendel. 
if we see, of course, we have to focus and realize that this explains what was the mindset of, of Jonah the prophet, but what God wasn't happy with this, obviously, and God was very angry about this. So what was, why was God angry about this whole situation? And I'd like to mention before we answer that question, I want to read to you another Midrash, and we'll wrap things together with all this. It says in the Midrash, there were three prophets that one of them demanded the honor of, of the father, but did not demand the honor of the child. In other words, who was that? We're going to see in a moment. And one, and one prophet demanded the honor of the child, but not the, the honor of the father. And then there was a prophet that demanded both the honor of the child and the honor of the parent. So who are these different prophets? And the, 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 the Midrash says to us, that Elijah the prophet demanded the honor of the father, but not of the child. In other words, Elijah was so zealous for God, but not for, not for the nation of Israel. And he was very, very strict against the nation, the way they were behaving. And the other prophet, the man, the honor of, of the child and not the father, was Jonah. He was so zealous about the nation of Israel, but not honoring God by listening to what he had to say. And there was a prophet, Jeremiah, who did both, honored the father and, of course, the child. And, which is interesting, of course, that this sort of sets up things in motion, in that we see the connection, we said it before, an interesting connection between Elijah, who saved the life of Jonah, and both of them are mentioned in this Midrash, which I'd like to get back, hopefully, at the end to discuss that, which is an interesting idea in itself. But in reality, we see here zealousness. There's a zealousness on the part of Elijah for God, and we see another side of a zealousness for the nation of Israel, his people. And that's coming from Jonah the prophet. And the question is, this, of course, came as a result of these great prophets, these reactions, but God wasn't happy, not with any of these kind of responses. God wanted them both to be rectified. And that we have to understand why did God send Jonah the prophet to this, to these, to the nations? What was the whole thing to go out there to these nations over here? They're are they're idol worshippers. They're evil, and then not only that, out of that Assyrians, they're going to come along and they're going to expel the ten tribes out of Israel. It seems to be doesn't make so much sense. But in reality, and there are other reasons why Jonah ran away. There are other explanations. What could be possible reasons why Jonah ran away? What made him run? Besides, for that reason itself. And there's another, well, maybe I'll mention a quick explanation, which I've read. Um, another explanation was Jonah felt that it wasn't, that God's behaving in such a kind, merciful um, way really wasn't, wasn't appropriate. Because if you think about it, these are idol worshippers as well. Why should I go to these idol worshippers and give them another chance? If you think about today, and you know, we're talking about very serious people that are committing serious offenses, these evil people. It's like going to like today, um, you know, places where these are Iranian leadership, all these evil regimes in the world, and trying to and trying to bring these evil re regimes back to repentance. So Jonah felt, listen, they've they've already done so many terrible atrocities in their actions. It's not really fair that you forgive them for that. So there's another approach completely. And saying that God is actually judging them with too much kindness by giving them another a second chance. They want another chance. Give them a pass. And in reality, Jonah, his name testifies to the fact that his name is Yonah ben Amitai, Yonah, the son of truth. In other words, he, the word in Hebrew, Amitai, comes from the word Emet being truth. He is a person who seeks the truth. And he felt this was not a fair deal that these people who are not oh, undeserving of God's love and kindness are getting love and kindness. And, and therefore, he runs away. That's another explanation. Um, I'd, again, I'd like to take, you know, you can combine the both. You can say in reality, he's running away. He's showing on one hand love and kindness to his people, but he's not willing. You know, you can say the same thing. Wait, if that's the case, why is, you know, why are you coming along with a complaint like that? that God is showing his love and kindness to these Ninveh people, and you expect it to do it to the people of Israel, also sitting at that time. And obviously, so therefore, there is, we have to deal with that situation as well. But I'd like to go on a little bit, once we have this down, these two 
ideas of what possibly made him run away. There are, there are other explanations as well, but I think two are now enough because I really want to get to the my um, insight that I see here. I think it's a very important lesson for us, and I want to get to that. And if we look, and I'd like to just read a few interesting um, verses here. The whole thing is amazing to read. We should read the whole thing together. But um, in order to understand the whole story, we have to understand also how the kikayon, that the plant that um, a worm destroys in the end, and Yon is so upset about it, how it fits in with the whole lesson over here as well. And we'll try to get to that as well. But let's begin by reading a few more verses in the beginning of chapter 1 in the book of Jonah. So we see when he, Jonah runs away, and what happens? It says, um, God brings about, after he hires a boat, it says God brings about a big, big wind, and there's a storm in the sea. And the boat is ready to go down. It's a big, powerful storm, some kind of hurricane out there. So now we're meeting a group of people here. First we spoke about Nineveh, now we're speaking about the sailors over here. Now, these say, who are these sailors on the boat? It seems like these are sailors, they're, they're traders, they're dealing with um, trade, etc. Whoever it is, they're on the boat over here. And they're, of course, idol worshippers, because it says right away, they're, they're yelling out everyone to their gods. In other words, they're very similar to the, the people of Ninveh. They could have perhaps been Ninveh people. And there are opinions that say that. Um, I didn't see it in Sabbath, but I was told that perhaps they might have been Ninveh people, which I think, logically, it makes sense. Because Jonah was trying to run away from his, his mission in talking to the Ninveh people, and God actually, he thought he was going to run away in a boat and get out of it, he ended up going on a boat with sailors that happened to be from Ninveh, perhaps. Okay, it could be. But anyway, nevertheless, it doesn't make a difference if they were from Ninveh or not, but they were similar in their ways of behavior. They were idol worshippers. And they're each crying out to their God, by throwing the vessels inside the sea to lighten the load. And Yonah, what does he do? He goes down and goes to sleep. Below, goes under, under the deck and goes to sleep. In other words, Jonah continues to run away from this whole thing, what's going on. He's going down below the deck. And so the, the captain of the ship comes and goes, what are you falling asleep on us over here? Call out to your God. Maybe he can help us. Call out to your God. So what does Jonah say? In the meantime, they come along with the different sea people, and they're trying to figure out, doing a lot a lottery, what happened over here? Why is this evil coming upon them? So they did this lottery. And it falls out on Jonah the prophet. So, and they said to him, "Why we, was this terrible evil coming upon us? And he starts asking questions. Jonah asking Jonah the prophet, "Who are you? What do you do? What nation are you from?" They started to ask all kinds of questions. So Jonah answers the question, "I'm a Jew." I'm an Ivri. And I fear the God of the heavens. Who created the heavens and he created the, um, the, the sea. In other words, he's beginning to give him a lesson that there's one creator in monotheism, there's one creator of the universe. And he's saying, that's who I fear. And I'm a Jew. In other words, I think, and this is again, I'd like to, my insight over here, is that God, Jonah, Jonah was really concerned about his people of Israel, completely. And he wasn't concerned about the nations of the world. And it's interesting that Rashi says, a famous commentary says that on the boat, there were representatives of every 70 nations of the world. They were on that boat. In other words, they believed there were 70 seamen, each one with a different religion, of idol worship religion of the different nations. They were all idol worshippers. And therefore, God placed him in their hands because God was saying, you're trying to run away from being a messenger to the nations. But I want to tell you something, Jonah, you can't run away from that, that duty of yours. You have to do that as well. And Jonah, in the beginning, we see he sort of keeps his distance. He says, I'm a Jew, here I am. You know, and then he starts sort of softening up a little bit, starts telling them, listen, 
There's a God out there, one among you, one God, monotheism. And he created the heavens and he created the sea. It's, in other words, the heavens and the earth, it's all God is the creator of the universe. Then it says in the next verse, amazing, it says in verse number 10, and the people feared greatly. And they said, what did you do? And he says, And they knew that he was running away from God. In other words, they began to believe he was being a true teacher and an emissary to this, to this many 70 nations on the boat over here. And he was teaching them. He says, no, what can we do to make the, the, the sea stop? And what does he say? And he says, Jonah says, throw me in the sea. And then the sea will stop storming. Because I know, because it's because of me that the sea is raging. Throw me in the sea, he says to them. So what do the people of the boat do? Now, if these were very evil people, they would have gladly threw them off right away. But no, they're trying to get back. They feel, wait a second, this guy's a special person here that they didn't know who he was in the beginning. They're trying to save his life as well. They're trying to find a way to get back. And they can't. Because the storm is, is getting stronger and stronger. And they have no choice. And now they're calling out it's amazing. Look at verse number 14. They're calling out now, not to their gods, it doesn't say anymore. They're calling out to God, the one God of the universe, yud ke vav ke the four-letter name of Hashem in the Torah. In other words, Yonah had succeeded in already having them shed off their idol worship. They're calling out to God and they're saying, God, you know, please don't place upon us someone who's innocent. We don't want to be, God forbid, blamed for the for throwing him off the boat. Ki ata Hashem kasher hafatz tasita. And then they, of course, put him inside. And it says, once they threw him in, inside the sea, and the sea relaxed. And it says right after that, Vayiru anashim yira gedola et Hashem. It says they feared a great fear to God. Vayizbechu zevach l'Hashem. Vayidru nidarim. And they offered sacrifices to God. In other words, we see a transformation on the boat from these seamen that are seemingly idol worshippers and far away from anything, and they believe in every possible religion that's under the sea, these idol worshippers. And slowly, on the boat, this process, not too slowly here, this whole process of being on the boat with Jonah the prophet brings them to a realization of the God in the universe. What does this remind you all of? This is exactly what the message that Jonah was supposed to do to the nations of the world out there in Ninve now. God was telling Jonah, you can't hide yourself from the nations. You must realize that as a nation of Israel, you have a great, great message to bring to the nations of the world, um, uh, to bring to the nations of the world, being a light to the nations. You will be a light to the nations. The time will come at the end of days. The nations are becoming running to the people of Israel for Torah, to learn and to see the light of God. And you can't hide from this mission. And they, this is the lesson that Jonah was being given. It's absolutely amazing. And because he tried to run away, on the boat itself already, he's already dealing with it, which is amazing. Right there he's doing it. And what happens? Jonah's in the sea. He doesn't want to live because, again, his concern is Israel. He's zealous for the life of the people of Israel. He doesn't think about the, the, the nations at this point at all. Just a little bit now, he got a touch of it. And then he's in the sea, and what does it say in, in chapter 2? And God sends a huge fish to swallow up Jonah the prophet. Now what is fish? Fish, in Gematria, if we take the letters, Dalit is 4 and Gimel is 3, that's 7. In other words, 7 represents 70 nations, right? If you take 70 and not drop off the zero... We call it the small gematria. Seven, he was swallowed up by the fish. In other words, he can't get away from the nations. He tried on the boat, he couldn't get away from it. He thought he'd jump off the, into the water, throw me out in the sea. And he's swallowed up by this dog. He's swallowed up by the dog. And because, in other words, God is saying to him, if you do not relate to the nations, if you don't think about that you have something to rectify there, you'll be swallowed up. You can't, you can't run away from that mission as well. 
And again, it's absolutely amazing if you go back, he ends up spitting, it goes in. He's praying in there, and he's and, and again it says, I'm not going to go through all the, I want you to read the whole chapter. When you go back later, you'll be amazed. But, um, and then God calls out to John again, and he says, go to, to Nineveh the second time. And, and so what happens is Yonah goes, of course, like God told him, and what happens is they repent, of course, and Vayaminu Anshay, it says in, in, in verse number five, they listen, the people of Nineveh, to God, and they call the fast, and they put on sackcloth, from the little ones to the older ones, and they were crying out, of course, and what happens is, it says um, later on, in verse number eight, they cried out powerfully to God. And everyone turned away from their evil ways. From, from robbing and stealing, which was in their hands. In other words, they were repenting. You know, God to turn away from his anger. They're praying out that God, they're praying to Hashem that God will turn away from his anger and he'll leave, um, you know, leave, he'll have mercy upon them. It says God saw their actions because they returned. God forgave their evil, forgave the evil they've done. In other words, we see here that the words Jonah succeeded. It's like he was, had fear of and he reached the, the hearts of the nations and he repented. But what, how does, what does Yonah react? How does he react? But nevertheless, Jonah wasn't satisfied. He did the mission against his will. He had no choice of going against Hashem. But he still didn't get the lesson yet of what it means to be a light to the nations and why it's so important. What is God sending him on this mission for? So Yonah feels terrible. He feels terrible about it. And what happens? He prays to Hashem. And he says, And he says, I ran away exactly for this reason. I knew that you're a God that will have mercy. And then he says, Now, He goes, Take my soul. Kill me, God. I don't want to live anymore. That's what he says. Unbelievable. He's totally broken. Totally broken. He says, um, So goes out the city, and it says, And he built a sukkah, And he was sitting in the sukkah, in the, in the shade. Until he could see what happened. He was waiting, he was sitting inside the sukkah. And then it says, It says, God gave Jonah, he gave him a beautiful kikayon tree. And he was sitting under the shade of this kikayon. And he's enjoying himself over there. And he felt, he was so happy that he had this kikayon tree. And then it says, right after that, In the morning, God sends a worm to the tree. And what does the worm do? He, he literally destroys the tree. Whatever it is, Yonah faints. I'm going to quickly read the end. And he feels like he's dying. And God says to Yonah, look at this. He says, you had mercy on this tree that you didn't do any work for. That it, from, it came up overnight. And I'm not going to have mercy on this big city that has 120,000 people, that they don't know from the right to the left. In other words, God was telling Yonah, maybe a message in my opinion about the Kikayon, what does the Kikayon tree symbolize? What is this whole strange thing? Because first says he, was in, he, he had the shade of a sukkah. He really didn't need any more shade if he had already like a booth. Something that we should have to try to understand. This powerful message at the end of the book of the Kikayon tree somehow has to connect to what we're discussing. How is it, we don't really see that Jonah woke up, or did he wake up? Did he come to a realization what's going on, that God wants him to be an emissary for the nations? But God was trying to teach him that in my opinion, a tree, what does a tree represent? A shade tree. You know, it's an expression in the Bible when a person's sitting under his tree, 
each tachat gafno tachat tenato. When a person is like sort of worried about himself, it says in the times of Solomon, you know, Israel, when people were very, very um, satisfied in their lives, they're all sitting under their shade trees. In other words, it's an expression of you're concerned and you're worried about your own, your own personal self. And not thinking about others as well. Sometimes people have that issue, they get too involved in their personal um, needs, their personal concerns, and they don't think about others. Now Jonah, on one hand, was a great man, a great prophet, of course, who can come up to his ankles on his greatness, right? He was concerned so much about his people. He loved his people, as we read in the beginning of the lesson. But God was saying there's something additional, and that's concern about the nations, being a light to those nations. So being under that tree, I think, represents sort of a secluded air environment. We're secluding ourselves. When you're under that shade tree, you're, worried, you're concerned only about your own people. But I created the entire world. And a, and a lot of these people don't know from the right to the left. And you can't be so harsh. You have to have that ability to realize in the end of days, these, these, these nations are going to return, they're going to repent. And you have to bring them back. And that's, the, that's one of the goals of the nation of Israel. The greatest goal of all is to be light to the nations. Besides being a nation to worship God in the world, we have to, of course, bring all the nations to worship Hashem in the world, to love God, to fear God. And this is really your mission, the mission of your people, of all the tribes. And therefore, it's very interesting that if we think about it, on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is a day where we have a high priest. The high priest has to repent for his home, for his wife and his family, he's in the house of Israel. So it's repenting for the whole nation of Israel. And on this day, God is saying, as you hear, I have a high priest who's worried and is concerned it's about the entire nation, all the tribes, everyone's being repented, everyone's being blessed, and you're all having this beautiful rectification. But God wants to remind us towards the end of this great day of Yom Kippurim, this is the message of our custom to read this chapter of prophecy, about Jonas, remember that we also have a concern not only for our personal selves, but we also have this mission in being a light to the nation. So as we rectify ourselves, and as we cleanse ourselves, we have to be just like the high priest who worries about us and is concerned about repenting for us, we have to be concerned about repenting for the nations. And we have to be high priests to the nations, which is mentioned in our sources in the end of days, all of Israel will be high, high priests, a koanim, a nation of priests, a holy nation. For the nations, we will reach out to the nations of the world and bring them back and rectify them. And this is a double message on Yom Kippur, not only to remain on our, under our tree. And if we're only concerned about our tree, what's going to happen to our tree? It's going to fall apart and disappear.